بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على الإنسان الكامل والكون الجامع الشامل سيدنا ومولانا محمد الذي كان نبيا وآدم بين الماء والطين وعلى وصيه وابن عمه أمير المؤمنين علي بن أبي طالب الذي كان وليا وآدم بين الماء والطين وعلى زوجته البتول ريحانة الرسول سيدة نساء العالمين فاطمة الزهراء التي كانت ولية وآدم بين الماء والطين وعلى الأئمة من ولدهم الذين كانوا أنوارا بعرش الله محدقين وآدم بين الماء والطين وبعد Today we will um, begin our discussion of الفقرة السادسة or paragraph 6 from the Kitab al-Mashair of Sadr al-Din al-Shirazi Mullah Sadra. We have already gone through a number of preliminary discussions and we spent a great deal of time on paragraph five <coughs> discussing especially this idea of inniyatul wujud. We will move ahead now with paragraph six where Mullah Sadra discusses uh, the indefinability of being. Now, that really is the overall title uh, of this particular mash'ar, al-mash'ar al-awwal, the first way station. In other words, the first way station in, or the first way station establishing that E, it being, or we could even translate it theologically, he, if we take it as absolute being God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is not in need of definition. So paragraph five really is more of a, mm, by way of introducing this notion of the indefinability of being, by indicating that the notion of being, the mafhum al-wujud, is uh, already known by people. That it's aghna al-ashya an it ta'rif. It is the least of things in need of definition. In other words, everyone possesses a certain minimal metaphysical intuition, an innate knowledge or knowing of what is meant by the term wujud by the term existence by the term being and what is indicated by the to be verb in english uh, you know by is was etc and it's only now in the sixth paragraph where he really gets into the notion of why it is not definable so let us read that paragraph six وَأَمَّا أَنَّهُ لَا يُمْكِنُ تَعْرِيفُهُ فَلِأَنَّ التَّعْرِيفَ إِمَّا أَنْ يَكُونَ بِحَدٍ أَوْ بِرَسْمٍ وَلَا يُمْكِنُ تَعْرِيفُهُ بِالْحَدِّ حَيْثُ لَا جِنْسَ لَهُ وَلَا فَصْلَ لَهُ فَلَا حَدَّ لَهُ ولا بالرسم إذ لا يمكن إدراكه بما هو أظهر منه وأشهر ولا بصورة مساوية له End of the paragraph As for the impossibility of defining it This is because a definition is given either as a logical designation, that's my rendering of had, or a description. 
rasm. Now I'll explain why I chose designation after I finish just the translation. It is neither possible to define it in the form of a logical designation, a had, since having no genus and no specific difference, or we could say since having neither genus nor specific difference, that's al-jins wal-fasl, it cannot have a logical designation nor in the form of a description that would be rasm, for it cannot be grasped through that which is clearer and more well-known than it, or through a concept which is equivalent to it. وَلَا بِصُورَةٍ مُسَاوِيَةٍ لَهُ So why did I choose designation rather than definition for translating? Um, the word had, simply because typically in Islamic logic books, the treatment of definition is designated by the term at ta'rif. And then under at ta'rif, we have aqsam. So, for example, just to refer to the most um, widely read and studied classical work of Islamic logic, even though it's written in modern times, at least in the Shia seminaries, the Hawzat, that would be, of course, the Mantiq of Al-Mudhaffar. We have the section Aqsam wa Ta'rif. Now, there are many editions, so I'm not going to bother quoting page and number, but uh, this is all um, easily accessible through any edition. You refer to the table of contents, and so it comes under Aqsam wa Ta'rif, the types of definition. And so at ta'rif haddun wa rasmun. So definition is either logical designation or description, had and rasm. So I chose designation rather than definition because definition is, is in turn its own category or let's say genus. And under that we have had and rasm. Um, now to actually be fair, there's also a kind of um, in English, maybe, maybe we might say a working definition, a colloquial definition, or an imprecise definition, which is a ta'rif al lafzi And we're not really concerned with a ta'rif al lafzi but typically what you will find is that you can't give a definition in the sense of designation or description of wujud by uh, employing what needs to be employed there, genus and species and so forth. And so what you end up doing is coming up with things or locutions, phrases, which might be more familiar to the person that you're talking to. And that's called a ta'rif al lafzi where you just, um, you know, come up with uh, a, you know, we could call it a lexical definition, um, where you are simply exchanging one set of words for another, uh, and that set of words which you are exchanging for the other is presumably more familiar to the one, to the person being addressed. So you have to remember that in logic, if you recall your studies of logic, if you haven't studied logic, we have for ta'rif or definition, we have al-had wa rasm Al-had is logical designation, rasm is description. And in turn, the had is al-had tam wa al-had naqis That is to say, a complete logical designation and an incomplete logical designation and Similarly, we have a rasmut tam or rasmut naqis, or complete description and incomplete description. Al haddu tam, that is to say, the complete logical designation involves jins and fasl. In other words, genus and specific difference, al qaribain. In other words, the proximate species, uh, sorry, the proximate genus and specific difference. And so, you know, that's the, the, the almost cliched al-insan huwa haywan un natiq So haywan is the genus and natiq is the specific difference. It's that thing which distinguishes it from everything else under the genus of animal, rational animal, the animal that possesses rationality and speech. Al-had al-naqis means that you will have what's called al-fasl al-qarib, the proximate specific difference at the very minimum. Um, so you might say that define a human being, what you would use nataq as the specific difference, rational, 
but instead of animal, you would have, um, you know, a a a, a body, a physical body which grows, etc. Just munam and mutaharikin, etc. And then you would add a nadir. Uh So that would be considered an incomplete definition. And then similarly for a rasm, you might define the human being as haywan and dahik, in which case you have the jins, the genus, but a dahik is not the specific difference, rather it is what's called al khassa, which in English is rendered by the word pr taken from the Latin proprium. Finally, a rasm naqis, you have at least the khassa. Yeah, you could drop the genus, and in that case, if we were defining insan, we would just say dahikun. Of course, that does not include, exclude the typical example they bring in is the hyena, and therefore it is an incomplete description. So this is just a quick review of the terms from logic, ideas from logic, which of course you can find in Mantaq al Mubaffar, and this is a very good edition uh, with the commentaries of Ra'id, um, the glosses of um, Sayyid Ra'id al Haydari, known as Al Muqarrar fi Tawdihi Mantaq al Mubaffar. Very well, so much for that. So, wujud cannot be defined, existence cannot be defined because it is the most general of things. It doesn't have a genus. And therefore, it has no specific difference, it has no proprium, it has no common accident, it has no species, it doesn't have any of those things which are involved in ta'rif. And so you cannot form a definition of wujud. Now there is another important notion here, and that is that the term wujud, the term wujud, we'll just spend a few minutes on this before we move to the next paragraph, which is paragraph seven, which um, carries on from paragraph six with this whole discussion of why things can't be defined. But there is another uh, point which I would like to bring up, which uh, I don't, which I was unable to in previous lessons. And that is the notion of what, <coughs> how the term wujud is used. So fine, we say we can't define it. Nevertheless, we use the word wujud. We use, um, you know, equivalents in other languages like existence or being. In Persian, hasti, for example, you would use that in Urdu as well. In Turkish, it would be varlik, at least in modern Turkish. Um, so you have all of these, these words which are used. Now, how are these words employed in the language? So here we have a very interesting area, which in uh, Islamic logic is called al-ishtiraq. And you have two kinds of ishtiraq. So ishtiraq, we might translate as uh, hom homonymy. So you have words that sound the same, but they have different meanings. So for examples of ishtiraq, uh, I think that Ibn Sina somewhere uses the word, f um, you know, foot. You can use, obviously we're translating, but let's just keep it in English. But he uses the equivalent, right? it would be qadam. But in English, we will say foot. So what is foot? Well, you have a foot of a human being. Uh, you have the foot of a table, or maybe we would say leg. We would say a leg of a human being and leg of the table would probably be uh, more what we'd use in English, right? So you have leg used in two different senses. You have the leg, of a, <clears throat> leg of, uh, of, of a living thing like a human being. You can have the leg of a horse. You can have the leg of a table. You can have the leg, a tripod sits on three legs, right? You have words like in English such as bat and they are, and that word is, is ambiguous. You can have bat referring to um, a creature a well-known creature that flies at night. It can refer to a kind of instrument used in sports. And there again, you have different kinds of bats. There's the bat employed in cricket. 
There's the bat employed in the American sport of baseball. So there are these kinds of terms. Um, so what kind of ambiguity are we actually talking about when it comes to wujud? In this context, um, to keep it simple, um, you know, there's a lot of references, there's discussion of these things. In, in fact, in Aristotle, it goes back uh, quite a long time it's a, ago. It's a very old discussion. But in this context, <coughs> this material is, is nicely uh, summarized in my colleague's book, Mullah Sadra and Metaphysics, subtitle Modulation of Being. This is by my uh, friend, uh, Sajjad Rizvi. It's um, the published version of his PhD dissertation. It was first published by Routledge in London in 2009. Uh, this is my autographed copy. I obtained this on uh, Friday, September 2nd, 2016, in London at the Bloomsbury Hotel. At any rate, I refer you to uh, this edition to page 42. Uh, correction, I refer you to page 47. We might go back to 42 after this. <coughs> Excuse me. So we want to look at how the term wujud is applied. In logic, we would say, what is the extension, extension, E-X-T-N-S-I-O-N, of the term being or the term wujud? So ishtirak, this kind of homonymy, <coughs> literally can be rendered as commonality. The verb ishtaraka can be literally rendered in the context we're talking here as commonality. So at the bottom of page 47, under the uh, boldface heading of the extension of being and a question of theology, Sayyid Sajjad Rizvi writes, what sort of commonality, commonality is in inverted commas, does being possess? In other words, what sort of ishtirak, what sort of ishtirak does the term wujud possess in Arabic? And of course, he's going to introduce that there's two kinds of ishtirak. If you're familiar with logic, again, we can refer you to the to Mantaq uh, al-Mudaffar, uh, there is al ishtirak al lafzi wal ishtirak al ma'nawi. And in Mantiq al Mudaffar, that would be under the chapter heading Taqsimat al Alfaz. And then he has al Mukhtas, which is the first one. And then the number two is what we're concerned with al Mushtarak. Al Mushtarak wa huwa al lafzu al ladhi. تعدد معناه وقد وضع للجميع كلا على حدة. So that is a term, a word, an utterance, which has more than one meaning, but it has by convention been used for all of the meanings in question. Of course, the examples in Arabic are for, he gives uh, Ain. So Ain uh, refers to the sense of sight. It refers to a well, Yanbu Alma, a Dhahab, you know, gold. It can refer to gold. Uh, it can refer to, um, you know, the thing itself. Also, uh, he gives the term Al Joan. Joan can refer to both black and white. Um, that itself is a sub subclass of words in Arabic known as al-adad, but um, that bahath or that investigation is more appropriate in uh, a language class. And there's a lot of, you know, instances of commonality or homonymy in Arabic. He says, well, mushtaraku kathirun fi al And indeed, there's a lot of instances of that in English and, and many other languages. Uh, but there is al-ishtiraq, al-lafli, والاشتراك المعنوي and if you have the Ra'id Sayyid Ra'id al-Hayduri edition he goes into that in the footnotes um, 
you know, if you're really serious about Islamic studies, you need to get some dictionaries. In the footnote, um, Sayyid Ra'ad al-Haydari refers to a specialized dictionary. When I said you need dictionaries, I mean specialized dictionaries. So there's a famous specialized dictionary for the Islamic sciences, a small, very manageable, it's called at tarifat by Sharif al-Jurjani. There are other ones like Kashaf al-Tarhat al-Funun, and there is uh, Dastur al-Ulama, etc. What sort of commonality does being possess, right, Sayyid Sajjad Rizvi? Either the semantic form is shared, this is al-Ishtaraq al lafdi so you have a sharing in semantic form, or the semantic content is shared. When the semantic content is shared, we have al-Ishtaraq al-Ma'nawi. Thus, being is not regarded as a mere homonym. Ah, it's not a mere homonym, like words like ain or al jawn in Arabic, or bat, or leg in English. It is critical to differentiate between the two to avoid the trap of considering the notion of being across its instances to be, goes to page 48 now, to be ambiguous in Sadra as Rahman does. He is referring to a book by Fazl Rahman that came out in the 70s called The Philosophy of Mullah Sadra, um, but we will not be concerned with that. So he continues by saying, it is misleading to consider tashkik simply as ambiguity in a sabra. So he's talking about tashkik al-wujud. But the point is that what kind of commonality or what kind of ishtiraq do we have with wujud? And the answer is that wujud is a mushtarakun ma'nawi. In other words, <coughs> it's not an instance of homonymy of the kind we have and the examples we just gave where you have one word which by convention means you know completely different things that 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 often bear no relationship to one another on the in in contrast wujud is a mushtarakun ma'nawi and this idea of uh ishtarak or mushtarakun ma'nawi is uh, very important and is closely related to the notion of tashkik al wujud so we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves but the idea that there are gradations in being. And so being applies, is famously said by Aristotle, um, that being is said in many ways, and I think it's, it's book Zeta of the metaphysics. <laughs> so there is this idea of uh, ambiguity, or if you like, a kind of notion of gradation and that's what Sajjad translates as modulation of being. So I just want to uh, refer to one other brief quotation from Sajjad's book on page 42. And here he talks about precedence and background. That's the boldface heading at the very top of the page. In other words, precedence and background to these ideas of, uh, especially of Tashkik, but in terms of precedence and background, it goes back to uh, this discussion of homonymy or commonality and other related terms. So Aristotle tells us, right, Sajjad, at the beginning of book Zeta of the Metaphysics, you should know that this book of Aristotle was oftentimes in the Arab world referred to as Kitab al-Huruf, which is kind of peculiar it's because each chapter has some sort of a Greek letter designating it, and hence the term Huruf. So at the beginning of book Zeta, or Z, of the metaphysics, or Z, if you like, if you're British, there are, you know, he says that there are several senses in what a thing may be said to be. He quotes the Greek here, ta onta legetai polakos. In the topics, another book by Aristotle, he distinguishes between words that have many meanings and singular meanings, and Alexander in his commentary, that would be Alexander of Aphrodisius, Aphrodisius, if not mistaken, in his commentary, in other words, on the topics, tells us that this is the distinction between homonyms, homonoma in Greek, and ambiguities, amphibola in Greek. But it could also be argued, as Alexander does, that the very fact of dividing being into the different senses that are the categories <clears throat> entails a homonymy. So there is a, another very important text by Aristotle known as the categories, and this 
is a work of logic, and these categories, these are the ten categories, or al-maqulat al-ashar, they're also known as the ten predicaments, or the predicamentia, or predicamenta, excuse me. Um, so there's the division into substance and accident, and then you have nine accidents, and substance is the first maqula, or the first category or predicament. Predicament in the sense of predication, not in the sense of you're in some sort of a crisis. Uh, so let's go a sentence or two forward in this paragraph. He says, the first significant philosopher in the Islamic tradition, Abu Nasr al-Farabi, follows uh, this with a threefold scheme of the homonymy of being. Being across the categories. Being as actual and potential. In other words, as al-quwa and fa'al, and as affirmation and negation. <clears throat> in a logical uh, proposition, in other words, sidq al -kith. To be sure, the early history of homonymy in the Hellenic tradition was a medi meditation upon the functions and meaning of the theory of categories. This Aristotelian semantics of being was extended in Neoplatonism, and one could try to map tashkik onto it. Within the Neoplatonic hierarchy of being, the existence predicate is a scalar and comparative adjective that corresponds to levels of reality. In fact, Lloyd, I think he's, which Lloyd is this? Uh, I don't know which, he's referring to some, he's quoting someone. The problem with these Routledge books is that they give you a footnote. It's not a footnote, actually. It's an end note, and you go all the way to the end, and it just says Lloyd, and it'll give a date, a year, and then you have to go to the bibliography. In, other, in, other, in any case, this is a very nice uh, quotation. Can we not read the Neoplatonic being existence as a system in which hypostases, processions, and the affairs of men are waves and ripples on, rather, of a single substrate? The point, then, is that wujud is a mushtarak ma'nawi, this, this uh, nicely also relates to the notion of tashkik al-wujud or uh, a gradation or ranking or modulation of being, haqiqat of the reality of being actually, haqiqat al-wujud. And so wujud is not used in the same sense when talking about the wujud, for example, of a flea and the wujud of a lion, and the wujud of a galaxy or a supernova, or even the wujud of something non-existent, like a unicorn. And perhaps the unicorn actually refers to an animal, but maybe now it's extinct. So again, it's a non-existent thing. Uh, the wujud of uh, zebras, the wujud of um, um, the uh, Tyrannosaurus rex, uh, the wujud of something you just dream up in your mind, the wujud of the characters in uh, Frank Herbert's Dune. I don't know. So wujud, you know, applies across the board to all sorts of things, to things that exist, to things that don't exist, things that only have mental existence, imaginary entities, impossible entities. So wujud is used in many, many different ways. And it's the same term, wujud, 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 existence, 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 being, 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 used in all of those, but it doesn't apply in the same way. And so it is what we would call a mushtarakun ma'nawi. Mushtarakun ma'nawi. In other words, there is a shared semantic content, and that's it. Um, and that semantic content, even that is shared, is uh, is quite different from one instance to another. Very well. Moving then on to paragraph seven, where the indefinability of being is further is further discussed and elaborated upon. He says. فَمَنْ رَامَ تَعْرِيفَهُ فَقَدْ أَخْطَأَ إِذْ قَدْ عَرَّفَهُ بِمَا هُوَ أَخْفَى مِنْهُ اللَّهُمَّ إِلَّا أَنْ يُرِيدَ تَنْبِيهًا وَإِخْطَارًا بِالْبَالِ وَبِالْجُمْلَةِ تَعْرِيفًا لَفْضِيًّا End of paragraph 7. Thus he that pines for a definition of it he that pines for a definition of it, in other words, a definition, one who longs for a definition of wujud has fallen into error, for he has defined it 
with that which is even more obscure than it. At best, one could offer a mere indication, a pointing, an allusion, giving rise to it. In other words, it here means the idea of it, the idea of wujud, of being existence in the mind. Yet this would be but a lexical explication of the word. In other words, ta'rif lafzi. There have been attempts by people to define wujud. So a very famous one, and these occur at the beginning of the tajrid al-a'tiqad. Wujud is the established in itself. Al-wujud huwa thabit al-ayn. And then al-adam will become al-manfi al-ayn, that which is negated in itself. But these are circular definitions. They don't really get you anywhere. They are at best, as he said, ex explications of, of the word or explication of the mere word, of the mere term. Um, these are nicely collected together in one place um, in Jalaluddin Ashtiani's Persian study, Hasti as Nazare Falsafe or Irfan, existence or being from the point of view of philosophy and Irfan Gnosis uh, in Fasli Duvum Dar Bayane Taurife Vujud in clarification of what it means to define being. So he has these quoted here. He gives another reference. You know, some people have said that Vujud may be defined, and he translates it into Persian saying, Vujud onas ki bishavad az u khabardod. In other words, al-wujudu ma yumkinu al-ikhbar anhu. Wujud, existence or being, is that which is capable of being predicated. Okay? Doesn't really help us. So as Ashtiani says that these ta'arifat, these ta'arif, they are ta'arife haqiqiyya nist. They are not true definitions. They are merely merely what? They are lexical definitions. They are mere explications of the word. So, <clears throat> the point is that wujud impresses itself upon the human mind without the mediation of any other concept without the mediation of any other concept whatsoever. And there's a famous quotation, there's a famous passage, it's a really long one, Ashtiani quotes the whole thing, it's from the Kitab al-Shifa of Ibn Sina, the Ilahiyat section, the metaphysics of Ibn Sina. If I'm not mistaken, it's in Fasl number five. Um, <coughs> yeah, it is Fasl Panjom, it says here. In which he says, Inna al mawjuda um, we're fortunate that we have a translation by Michael E. Marmura. This was certainly covered in my lectures on the Shifa, which are on YouTube over Al-Maqalat Al-Ula, the first discourse, or what he calls book one. So he says the ideas, here he says ideas for ma'aniha, the ideas of the existent, the thing, and the necessary are impressed in the soul in a primary way. Very true. So again, there's this notion of the badahatul wujud, that uh, it is impossible to to define being and any um, attempts, regardless of how um, ingenious they may be, at best result in lexical definitions, mere explications of the word. And uh, in fact, they don't even qualify there because if you have a ta'rif lovely, then presumably you say some word which is more familiar to the person. 
so athabit al ain or al manfi al ain in the case of adam is not exactly more familiar to people uh, as is the case with al wujud ma yumkin al ikhbar anhu so these are just ultimately circuitous locutions circular definitions which really <clears throat> don't get you anywhere there is a very small point here though uh, Ibn Sina says in al mawjuda he says the existent he doesn't say the existence and i think that's a, um, an important difference <clears throat> he's talking about existing things in other words he's really what he's saying is that the the the, the notion that a thing exists uh, so he's not really talking about wujud, existence, but the notion of a thing exi uh, existing, an existent thing. Now that's a very fine distinction, but it is an important one. Um, so there is a difference between al-mawjud, an existent entity, and al-wujud, existence itself. So going to paragraph eight, we'll try and finish this whole mash'ar today. This uh, continues on. So he has a wow here. He says, aqulu." So that's like a moreover in English. We would say, you know, moreover, aqulu anna tasawwur al-shay, anna tasawwur al-shay, or even in the would probably also work. Mutlaqan ibaratun an husuli ma'nahu. Now, if you actually have the original Korban edition, there's some sort of a smudge here, and, and it looks like there's a dot above the sod that can't be, it can't be hudul, it's husul. But if you have the Nasr edition, it should be clean. An husuli ma'nahu fin nafsi mutabiqan lima fil ain. وَهَذَا يَجْرِي فِي مَا عَدَى الْوُجُودِ مِنَ الْمَعَانِ وَالْمَاهِيَّاتِ الْكُلِّيَّةِ الَّتِي تُوْجَدُ تَارَةً بِوُجُودٍ عَيْنِيٍّ أَصِيلٍ وَتَارَةً بِوُجُودٍ ذِهْنِيٍّ ظُلِّي مَا نِحْفَاضِ ذَاتِهَا فِي كِلَى الْوُجُودَيْنِ وَلَيْسَ لِلْوُجُودِ وُجُودٌ آخَرَ يَتَبَدَّلُ عَلَيْهِ مَا نِحْفَاضِ مَعْنَاهُ خَارِجًا وَذِهْنًا So let's look at this. So it's, um, it's moreover, he's saying moreover, it is my contention that the conception, tasawwur al-shay mutlaqan, the conception mutlaqan, in the most general sense of anything, any shay, is but the realization of its meaning in the soul. Husul ma'anahu fin nafs mutabiqan conforming to that which exists fil'ain in concreto in the external world <clears throat> so again moreover it is my contention that the conception in the most general sense of anything is but the realization of its meaning in the soul conforming to that which exists in concreto and this holds true for things other than being <laughs> مِنَ الْمَعَانِ وَالْمَاهِيَاتِ Such as Ma'ani uh, I've just rendered, I would render as meanings. I'm not sure what uh, Nasr has. I don't have a copy of Nasr in front of me. Does anyone have a copy in, of, of Nasr? What does Nasr and Kalin have? Okay, well, if someone, if someone can, uh, has a copy and they can chime in at any time. So I would just say meanings, وَالْمَاهِيَاتُ الْكُلِّيَّةِ and universal quiddities, and universal quiddities which exist sometimes with an existence in concreto and sometimes with a shadow-like existence in the mind whilst preserving its essence in both modes, in, in both modes of existence <clears throat> being has no other existence with which it can be exchanged whilst preserving its meaning in concreto and in the mind 
Well, this is a very interesting paragraph because here he's getting into a, another very important uh, distinction in wujud. And I already gave some examples of the how wujud is a mushtarakun ma'nawi that it applies to all sorts of instances of being. And we can also conceive of things that often exist only in the mind or what he calls um, a shadow-like existence. Yeah, he says, wujud dhihni dhilli, a shadow-like existence in the mind. <clears throat> And sometimes you can have both. You can have the concept of a thing in your mind, but there's also a ex thing in the external world. But you can also conceive of imaginary things, uh, which, which only have a mental kind of existence, like the characters in a fictional work, the characters, the plot, the whole scenario, uh, you know, the entire fictional story of, say, something like um, Bleak House by, by Dickens, a very nice novel, uh, for example or uh, entirely fictional things like um, they often give the example of the anqa the you know the, the griffin this flaming bird or also known as the phoenix or a unicorn or you know even some you know some fictional creature completely fictional invented by people like the sandworms on the planet arrakis in dune for example or uh, you know the creatures on planet vulcan in star trek a much earlier era of science fiction <laughs> But you get the idea. So these things have only a mental existence. They don't really have any external effects. And so there is a very important distinction to be made between al-wujud al-ayni al-kharaji and al-wujud al-dhihni. <coughs> in other words, existence in concreto and existence in the mind. So he goes on, in 9, he, he draws a conclusion. He says, fa, so fa is like a concluding, for, for introducing a conclusion like thus or therefore. فَلَيْسَ لِكُلِّ حَقِيقَةٍ فَلَيْسَ لِكُلِّ حَقِيقَةٍ وُجُودِيَّةٍ إِلَّا نَحْوٍ وَاحِدٍ مِنَ الْحُصُولِ Thus, each ontic reality has but one mode of actualization. فَلَيْسَ لِلْوُجُودِ وُجُودٌ ذِهْنِي وَمَا لَيْسَ لَهُ وُجُودٌ ذِهْنِي فَلَيْسَ بِكُلِّي وَلَا جُزِّي وَلَا عَمْ وَلَا, ج... ولا, uh, ولا خاص. Thus each ontic reality has but one mode of actualization. the reality of being that's what he really means here he says falaysa lil wujud he means haqiqatul wujud has no mental existence and that which has no mental existence can be neither universal nor particular nor general nor specific fahuwa min dhati this is paragraph 10 fahuwa min dhatihi amrun basiqan mutashakhisun bi dhatihi la jinsa lahu wa la fasla lahu for in its essence it namely existence namely being wujud is a simple thing individuated by its essence having neither genus nor specific difference لا جنس له ولا فصل له ولا هو أيضا جنس لشيء ولا فصل له ولا نوع ولا عرض عام ولا خاصة. Nor also does it constitute, nor also does وجود, does being, does existence constitute for any other thing a genus or a specific difference or a species or a common accident or proprium. وَأَمَّا الَّذِي <clears throat> Excuse me. وَأَمَّا الَّذِي يُقَالَ لَهُ عَرَضِيٌّ لِلْمَوْجُودَاتِ مِنَ الْمَعْنَ الْإِنْتِزَاعِ الذهني. As for that, which is spoken of as being accidental to existing things, it is one of the mental abstract notions, and thus it cannot constitute the reality of being. 
فليس هو حقيقة الوجود بل هو معنى ذهني rather it is but a mental notion من المعقولات الثانية an instance of a secondary intelligible كالشيئية والممكنية والجوهرية والعرضية والإنسانية والسوادية وسائر الانتزاعات المصدرية So it is, ra rather it is but a mental notion, an instance of a secondary intelligible such as thingness, such as contingency, such as substantiality, such as accidentality, such as humanity, such as blackness, and all other abstract infinitives which are employed in reference to things both real and unreal التي يقع بها الحكاية or تقع بها الحكاية عن الأشياء الحقيقية أو غير الحقيقية وكلامنا ليس فيه بل المحكي عنه وهو حقيقة واحدة بسيطة Our concern is not with these, with these secondary intelligibles but with that which is a unique simple reality لا يفتقر أصلا في تحققه وتحصله إلى ضميمة قيد فصلي أو عرضي صنفي أو شخصي Our concern كلامنا is not with these but with that which is a unique simple reality حقيقة واحدة بسيطة which for its realization for its tahakkuk is not, which for its realization and actualization, primarily and essentially, in no way is in need of additional delimitation, bamimat qaid, by way of a specific difference, qaid and fasli, or accident, o aradi whether the latter be either of a class, sinfi, o shakhsi, or of an individual. So again, he's elaborating further, I think in very, very beautiful and very concise and very elegant, uh, very beautiful and very concise and elegant construction in Arabic. It's a beautifully crafted paragraph of how Wujud is not capable of being defined. And the concluding paragraph of al mashar al awwal paragraph 11, says, <coughs> continuing on with this argument, بَلْ قَدْ يُلْزِمُهُ هَذِي الْأَشْيَا بِحَسَبِ مَا يَتَحَصَّلُ بِهِ وَيُوجَدُ مِنَ الْمَعَانِي وَالْمَاهِيَاتِ Rather, these things are necessarily concomitant to being in accordance with that which is actualized by being. In terms of meanings and quiddities, min al ma'ani wal mahiyat. Is kullu wujud. إذ كل وجود سوى الوجود الأول البسيط الذي هو نور الأنوار يلزمه ماهية ماهية كلية إمكانية تتصف بهذه الأوصاف باعتبار حصولها في الأذهان فيصير جنسا أو فصلا أو ذاتيا أو أرضيا أو حدا أو رسما أو غير ذلك من صفات المفهومات الكلية دون الوجود so rather these things are necessarily concomitant to being in accordance with that which is actualized by being in terms of meanings and quiddities and so exists. For necessarily concomitant to all that exists with the exception of the first simple being al-wujud al-basit al-awwal or al-wujud al-awwal al-basit which is the light of lights al الذي هو نور الأنوار is universal contingent quiddity ما هي كلية إمكانية which is qualified by these qualifications 
in according to their occurrence or in accordance with their occurrence in the mind, becoming thereby in the mind a genus or a specific difference or a substance or an accident or a logical definition or a description or some other qualification of universal notions. Except for being, which is thus qualified only accidentally. So that brings us to the end of the first mashar. Um, there is a lot of information there. You should uh, look over it in Arabic carefully. You should look at the translation. And next time we will look at al mashar al-thani, which is fi kayfiyati shumudi hi lil ashya. In other words, it's devoted to how um, or in what way, in what sense, we can say that wujud encompasses um, all things. Shumul is the term in Arabic. Um, so if we have any questions, <coughs> we can <coughs> deal with those questions now. Otherwise, that concludes today's uh, lesson. So I'll give it a minute or two if anyone wants to chime in with any questions. No, no questions on my end. <laughs> no questions on your end. Okay, so then next time, as I said, we will look at the comprehensiveness of the reality of being, that's al-mash'ar al-thani fi kayfayti shumulihi lil-ashya. You have to understand, that's the final thing I'll say, that when he says fi kayfayti shumulihi lil-ashya, or how it is, literally if we translate, because there are pronouns here, how it is that it encompasses all things. The it is wujud, but it's not the mafhum al-wujud, not the notion of being, but the haqiqat al-wujud. So it's the shumul haqiqat al-wujud or the comprehensiveness of the reality of being <clears throat> that is dealt with in al-mash'ar al-thani and in this second way station. He introduces a bunch of, uh, a, a group of very important concepts which we find in, especially in Irfan, especially in the Sufism of Muhyiddin ibn al-Arabi. And they are An-Nafas al-Rahmani, the breath of the infinitely compassionate or the all-merciful. He associates this with uh, a rahma of Allah which encompasses of all things. Uh, there's also Al-Haq al-Makhluq bihi. This is also a concept from ibn al-Arabi, the truth created thereby, so to speak. There's also, what's another one? In Bisat Nur al-Wujud, the spreading forth of the light of being. That's also a kind of Ishraqi concept. Um, so there are a lot of terms which are there, especially in paragraph number 12. It would be worth your while to uh, look those up in uh, Sufi writings and see what you find there. That would be instructive for next time. But we will um, discuss these one by one the next time we meet, inshallah. So thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you for following these lectures. Wallahu alam wa alaykum fi